Good morning, Blue Water Church. On this Thanksgiving weekend, I trust that this weekend you'll have some time for rest, but also some times to reflect on the goodness of God in your lives. This morning, we are once again hearing from Bill Johnston. Bill is doing a five-part sermon series for us called Insights into the Future. And today he is talking about reminding us that God is our provider. What a great thing to be reflecting on on this Thanksgiving weekend. So let's go to him now. So I really, this was an amazing trip up here um, this morning. The colors were incredible. Um, saw a rainbow. I got to enjoy some of that farm fresh air. You know, the kind that cleans your sinuses out. Even though you had your windows closed and all the rest of it. It is great to be here. I am very excited for you that Steve is very excited to be coming here. Um, he just is so looking forward to it, moving into the area and settling down. Um, and I'm just so happy for him and for you. Uh, let me pray before I start talking. Jesus, um, I pray that this morning, that whatever I say, that this would all be about you, not about me. I pray that your Holy Spirit would um, open our ears and awaken our spirits to connect the way you want to connect with us this morning, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Um, be the speaking God that you are. And uh, may we leave this place um, having learned something, but also knowing that we've met you in this place. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, quick and short review. Last time we talked about Jeremiah 29 and quoted verses 10 and the beginning of verse 11. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, God says, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And we talked about the first insight it was that God gives us direction. He gives us direction. And I'm going to do a quick summary. Um, and by the way, um, I got some of this thinking from Andy Stanley in his book, The Principle of the Path. And if you don't have that book, I'd highly recommend it. It's really a great book um, about walking through life and uh, making right choices and those kinds of things. What gets our attention determines our direction and ultimately our destination. Our direction, not our intention, determines our destination. So pay attention to your direction. Um, I didn't know I didn't know, need a map to get here today because once I go somewhere, I can typically remember where I've been. Uh, so I'm fortunate that way. Um, I know others that are very directionally challenged and often get themselves uh, in places they really don't want to be. Insight number two is today. Not only does, does, does God give us direction, God also gives us provision. Not, not any, every one of us in this place this morning, everybody walking by, every one of us needs provision. We need stuff. Um, from food to whatever you can imagine, um, we need provision. So alongside of my interim ministry, I have a painting business. Um, I'm looking forward to retiring from my painting business <laughs> down the road um, because it, it uh, causes grief to my shoulders and other things. But one of the companies that I work for has streamlined and simplified their purchasing process. That means I no longer have to buy my own supplies, come up with invoices and, and send it in to be reimbursed. I simply tell them what I need, which typically is rollers, tape, and tray, tray liners. It's pretty <laughs> simple. Um, and anything else I can justify that they'll say yes to will work too. Uh, but that's the basics. And they buy it for me. So there's two important things to me. First, I have to ask for my provisions. I have to ask. They don't just randomly show up on the shelf. If I walk by and they're not there, I know <laughs> you didn't ask for your supplies. The second thing, I need to maintain a good relationship with the one I'm asking. And in this case, it's Heather. You know Heather Oatliff from West Heights. And she is responsible for all of the projects. So if I don't communicate well or regularly, I will have no provisions. 
And again, it's, it's on me. Nobody else but me. So I can keep working. I can't keep working if the provisions aren't available for me for my projects. It's just logical. And that's like us in life. But to me, beyond that, I think it's like that with God also. Because with God, think about it. how could we do what God intends for us to do if he doesn't provide the necessary equipment and the supplies, spiritually and otherwise? How could that be possible? So God promises to provide for the necessary provisions that we need. He promises it for us. But first of all, we have to ask. We have to ask. And some would say, well, if God knows everything, and we'll look at this in, in a minute, if, we, if God knows everything, why would we have to ask? We ask because we still need to show God that we are intent on connecting with him, even though it's through thing, getting things that we need, but we have to ask. Second of all, we have to also have a good relationship with God and communicate regularly. It's not just this random thing again that somebody is living their own life and all one morning they wake up and think, I should pray about something. They haven't prayed for three years, but they have this need. And so they, and, and the, the relationship is so strange if it's even there between God and them that they're not even heard. So Jeremiah 29, the rest of another part of verse 11 is what we're looking at this morning. Last week, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, which is directions. But now there are plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Now, prosper does not mean that God is going to make you rich. It's like when the lotteries get really big numbers. What do we do? Well, because the odds are insane, absolutely insane now. God is not going to make you rich just because he says he's going to prosper you. It doesn't mean that. Prosper, prosper, the plans to prosper and not to harm you is literally translated thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts of peace, everything necessary for your well-being with God and with others is, is related to us. And it's the word that peace is the word shalom, that wonderful Hebrew word that's kind of hard to nail down because there's probably 30 different definitions to the word. And they include health and security and tranquility, welfare, good intentions, good, condi good condition, success, comfort, wholeness, secure, safe, happy, all of those things uh, come out of that one little word shalom, peace. So all of these combined reassure us that God is providing for us, providing for every area of our lives. Now, if you're crazy enough to make up a list about how your life is broken down and all of the needs that you have, you could somehow look at this list of what God wants to provide for us and find similarities and overlap, things maybe that you would think about today. I would really urge you to... Ask God this morning, and Melanie has already suggested this, um, ask God to show you or to speak into your life the thing that you need to hear this morning. That could be a, a great prayer. What do you want me to know this morning, God? Then you're only listening to one thing primarily, not everything. So all these things... All these things provide for every area of our lives. And his thoughts toward us, he says, are never wicked or evil, but thoughts of peace. Every time God thinks about you, he thinks with that sense in his mind. Peaceful thoughts. Let's look for, at uh, some of the examples of provision. The first one that I've listed is that God provides us with food. Very basic. Um, I wouldn't be well if I hadn't had breakfast this morning. Um, I won't tell you how early I had it, but I have my, I love my oatmeal. I have oatmeal every morning. It's good for my cholesterol and a whole lot of other things. Um, and I just, uh, we were at Camp, Camp Cockwell last weekend, and it was this, you, you got this ladle, and it's this heavy, heavy, sticky oatmeal that once you're done eating it, you feel full like up to here. 
and hopefully that's you take less next day. God provides us. Listen to what uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 104. These all look to you. That is, and he has a list. Plants, cattle, birds, wild ghosts, badgers, lions, trees, and people. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. I was watching some of the farms when I was driving up here, and, and a lot of them were at the stage of feeding things. And uh, the one was, there's a llama farm way down that way, if you come the Elmira way. And I can tell that something was happening food-wise because they're all stampeding toward this one box. Because they know the one that's looking after them cares for them enough to always, always feed them. Psalm 145. The Lord is faithful to all of his promises and loving toward all he has made. The eyes of, the eyes of all look to you, that is to God, and you give them their food at the proper time, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The creepy spiders that you hate, <clears throat> hate, the snakes, the things that you just don't like at all, that exist, that are alive, God is looking after them. Odd as you would like that to be. God is satisfying the desires of every living thing. And I would say the primal thing that he's interested in is your well-being, more than the animals, more than anything else alive. I love Psalm 81, verse 10. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. And we sometimes don't go very far in wanting to be filled. We would rather still do our own thing. I want to read something from... Uh, Chuck Swindoll, some of you know about who, who Charles Swindoll is. And he, uh, he, he says this, Consider the Israelites on their way to the promised land. They had many needs. These people didn't have to work for their food or their clothing. Not one day for 40 years. Every morning, instead of going to get the mail or the paper, they gathered up the day's groceries, delivered to their front door for 40 years. There was no inflation, no sales tax, no long lines at the checkout counter, just a daily supply of nourishing food. As a matter of fact, God called it food from heaven, the bread of angels. Accompanying this morning miracle, he says, was the faithful cloud by day and the comforting fire by night, which gave them, gave them visible assurance of God's presence and protection. When thirst came, he quenched it with water that flowed from rocks like rivers. Those people enjoyed a perpetual catering service without cost, limit, labor, or hassle. All they had to do was show up, look up, eat up, and clean up. Yet for all of this, they came to the place where they resented heavenly cooked angel's bread. Already having much, they now wanted more. Having plenty, they now wanted variety. Having tried manna, they now wanted meat. He says, Exodus 16, 4 provides additional insight often overlooked. And I quote, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven, and the people will go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them. That I may test them. The manna was a test. God custom designed the diet to be a day after day, week after week test of their obedience, their patience, and their determination to persevere in spite of the monotony of the manna. They failed the test. I don't remember if it was the manna or if it was the meat later, um, but they wouldn't listen to just take so much for what you need that day. Some of them hoarded it, and the next morning it was, it was just disgusting. It was rotting, there were maggots and everything. Apartment, and they learned a hard lesson because they disobeyed what God was saying. Another piece of provision God's provision and prayer. I would think that all of us, um, maybe I'll look in a mirror right now, um, could, could tweak our prayer life, not just out of necessity, because of, but out of intent, choosing to. Um, while I was at work yesterday painting, 
saw her on Friday. Uh, one of the girls in this retirement home, uh, she's like my hero. She's just amazing. She's She calls herself drill sergeant because she had a military dad, and that's kind of how she approaches her work as a PSW. And she is just always on the move, always looking after people, always caring. And uh, she came into my where I, in the room I was painting, and I, we knew, I knew her because I'd been there many times before. And she said, guess what? I said, what? Try not to splatter paint. And she said, me and two of the other girls are both Christians, and we're going to all uh, fast and pray for a month. Now, I forgot to ask her what she was going to pray about, so I'm going to talk to her next Tuesday. And she was just so excited um, because she never thought she would do something like this until the three of them got together and said, so they made this pact. And I, I just can't wait to find out what happened because of what they chose to do. Because it was a choice. They were intent on doing this. When you pray, Matthew says, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, because your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So why would we have to pray? Because the exercise of pray, prayer strengthens and stretches our faith to believe some of the stuff that He's teaching us. We do it because it's the right thing to do. I want to read um, a couple of verses uh, from chapter 6 of Matthew. And this is relation to God's provision and worry. How many of you are worriers? I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. God's provision and worry. Verses 25 to 27 Therefore I tell you, do not, wor do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and more, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or weep or store away in barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Don't worry about your life, what you will eat, drink, and wear. I just see people all the time, and I watch my um, grandchildren be clothed with things that are fashionable and appealing and all of these things. And I'm thinking it'd be really cool just to get something bland and boring, just to contrast that sometimes so you're not just getting the best of the best of the best. Now, you just discovered there's a discrepancy between the younger generation and a, a more mature gen generation. I use the word mature loosely, in case you think otherwise. Verses 28 and verse 34. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. In the last verse that I will quote, Therefore... Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Do you relate to that? Every day has its own stuff. And all we need to do is get through one day at a time. And as I've said to some people, sometimes it's one hour at a time. Ten minutes at a time, depending on their story. Don't worry about tomorrow, for worry, tomorrow will worry about itself. The next one is God's provision and grace. And this is from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It's Paul's story. Uh, he had this vision. He ended up in the third heaven, as he says it. He heard things that even angels weren't allowed to hear. And to protect him, oddly as it sounds, to protect him, um, God gave him a thorn in the flesh, which was literally in the text a messenger of Satan to trouble him, to bother him, to affect him. And of course, Paul, um, if you know the story, Paul prays and prays and prays three times. I can imagine how deeply he was praying that God would deliver him from this problem. And God never answered him, which was the answer. But God says this to him. And I, and I think every piece of this story applies to us in some way. 
the answer that he said wasn't what he was looking for, but it was the best for him. He says, my what? Grace. Grace is sufficient for you. You know what sufficient means? It means enough. You have everything that you have every day of God's grace for you to handle everything that you have to handle. Everything. Next, God's provision and contentment. Rather than worry, there's a lot to be said about contentment. Um, I know people that are worried about a lot of things that if they were just, if they were just content with those things um, and trust God, some of the problems would go away. Some of the stress and distress would fail away, fade away. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13, I rejoice greatly that in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what is it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every and any situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then a couple of verses later, we hear them see this verse. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Do you know what that means? Can you tell me what that means? I hear people all the time quoting this verse about um, climbing a mountain or jogging 50 miles or whatever it would be because God will give me strength and he'll quote this verse. What's the verse about? Do you know what the verse is about? Paul is specifically saying, I have learned to be content with whatever circumstances he is, good or bad, and his contentment is the thing in his life that keeps him sane, I think. Because he's looked, as he said, I love the, the line he uses, I have learned the secret. I would like to tap him on the shoulder and find out what the secret was. But simply to be content with where you are, with what you have, um, our culture is accelerating in the opposite direction. It's got to happen faster and faster and all these kinds of things. And it's always now. I can do everything through him who gives me strength means that whatever I face, <clears throat> I can be content. Because God's present, God walks for me. He's providing for me. Another is provision and faith. And this is um, a significant verse when it comes to this um, idea of uh, being con not just content, but be in this place where God can provide for us. And the verse is verse 10 of this, of this chapter. And it's from the New American Standard, which I choose on purpose. And it's a lot, one of the last verses in Philippians 4. My God will supply how many, how much? All of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now the NIV flips it and says his glorious riches. So in the NIV, the focus is on riches. In the New American Standard, in the literal translation, the focus is on God's riches in glory. It's the source of where the riches are coming from. And that's what matters more than um, just these glorious riches can be very random. His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. God's provision also affects our generosity. Second Chronicles 29, 14, David is in the, build, in the midst of building the temple He's having conversations about how Solomon will look after the whole piece, really. But he went to great lengths to amass a lot of content for that temple. In fact, there's one place that I couldn't find quick enough that basically <clears throat> people were bringing stuff to make this, to build this, and they had to stop them from bringing any more because they were getting too much. You imagine that problem in your church? <laughs> stop giving! We don't need your money. People would come to church from all over the place. they think you're crazy. But there he was. 
So he's here, and this is what David asks. Um, he's going to die soon, and Solomon's going to take over. He's going to build the temple, and this is what David said. Who am I, and who are my people that she would, we should be able to give as generously as this? Speaking to God, he says, everything comes from you, and we have given only what comes from your hand. See, we just give things to people because we got the cash or the resources or the ability to do so. It's one thing. But if our resources come from God's hand, that he's our provider, then our outlook will be different on, on what we say we do with that money. Uh, I married a woman that was very frugal. Frugal is a good word, by the way. <laughs> because everything that we have, everything we've been able to do, is because of a decision that we made, I think, before we were married, about how to look after God's money that he loans to us. And we don't have a big house, but we have a house that's adequate, and we love our house. We love everything about it. Um, the vehicles that we drive, we don't buy new vehicles anymore because it's kind of like a waste of money for us. Um, but every time, usually, it, it's usually like this, I get a call from Wanda. She's been out with somebody and she'll say, I saw a car. We should get this car. I respond back on the text and I say, I didn't know we were looking for a car. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I kind of, I don't hang up on her, but beyond the conversation, I start to feel really guilty because uh, I just, I just my wife. And I thought I should, I should call her back. And so I, I texted her, I texted her. And I said, well, um, I say, I'll go so far as to come over and look at it. So this is a Friday night. So I, I get over there, and she's got a smile on her face, and I don't like that smile. <laughs> she's already got it. And uh, we go, we drive this around the block, and we know the guy, um, a very reliable guy that is selling this car. He's like a car guy, and, and uh, just trust him. So we're, we're, we both get out of the car, we take turns driving the car, we park in the driveway, and we look at each other, and we, and we look at each other and we say, we need to buy this. The sacrifice was I had to get rid of my minivan. minivan. The joy is that with the minivan gone, the kids have to find transportation for themselves because we just have a car now. So it's wonderful. But it's this conversation, it's recognizing and I would say of three of all of the last three cars that we have bought, every one of them was a God thing. Every one of them. It was so obvious that it was a God thing. We just would drive home and just there's this sense of what God did. So to be generous and to give out of the heart of generosity um, because of what God has been teaching you and what you've been learning is a beautiful thing. Another one, and there's just a couple of more, God's provision and expectation. Whenever I go to a new church, I say, I tell people right off the bat, um, I don't care what you think about me. <laughs> I don't say it rudely, but I, I explain what I mean. I says, I, I will not live my life based on other people's expectations of me. So they know right off the bat, um, Bill is Bill. And I can't change, well, I can't change myself. I had one lady say to me, you, sh you don't have to be an introvert, you know. <laughs> No, I'm pretty sure I like being an introvert. Been there all of my life. It works. <laughs> but expectation. I'm going to really condense this. Consider Genesis 22. Abraham is tested. The text says that God is testing Abraham. And he wants I, to take him to take Isaac, his only son, and kill him on an altar, sacrificing him to God. That was the intent. And I can imagine as the shiny part of the knife was flashing in the sun, this um, angel of the Lord shows up and says, don't do that. And I'm thinking, I see sweat just pouring off of Abraham. What do you do when somebody asks you to do that whom you implicitly trust? And there he is. And God says this, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. I wonder what's the most important thing in your life that if God asked you to give it up would be a real trouble. 
Sometimes he wants that because that's the thing that's getting in the way of us, connecting with him. Abraham looks up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering. In the text it says, instead of his son. Very obvious. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. An old song, a chorus actually, is remind, it reminds me of that, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. That's what he wants to be to you and me. And I'm, the last one I'll mention is God's provision and his presence. And this is um, a quote uh, from Jeff Mannion. Moses experienced God's tender care in the wilderness, he says. There he was breaking under a load too heavy to carry, and God called him to approach the tabernacle, the tent representing God's presence, to draw near and to receive help from God, the grace of additional shoulders to carry the load. Sometimes we need help carrying our load. And a lot of it has to do with whether God's present in your life or not. I think even as I was driving up here, um, I was just praying that um, we would sense that nearness because some of us have been in that place at times where it, you're almost overwhelmed because it's so obvious that God is in the building. And God wants to be in the building. He lives in your lives if you're a believer. He's already there. But he wants to be in the building. He wants to be welcomed in the place so that he can have his way with the people that are in the place. Hebrews 4.16 Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and to find grace to help us in our time of need. And the last words I want to speak before I pray is the words that Jesus gave to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Yours isn't. Your buddies, people that could help you, isn't. God's grace is sufficient for you, and may that be the case today. Jesus, I'm so grateful for all that you um, endured so that we could find life. And you know, God, that life for us is just riddled with problems and bumps along the road and tragedies and all kinds of stuff that we never signed up for. But God, I thank you that you are a providing God, and I pray this week for anybody in this room, uh, you know what they're going through, you know their struggles, you know the things in their life that they celebrate, you know the pain that they carry, the worries. And I just pray, God, that this morning they would just walk away with a sense of your grace, how sufficient it is, how enough it is today, and will be tomorrow. So bless these dear people, I ask Jesus in your precious name.